The world left Bhopal long ago to its loss and lamentation. First the press, then the lawyers, and finally the doctors flew back home. Now there's just the humdrum traffic of a small and half-forgotten city. And the guilt of what happened to Bhopal has evaporated like the gas that poisoned it. The gas came at midnight. Breathless with panic, people ran out of their suffocating homes for lungfuls of the lethal air. Bodies were just lying, thousands. There were animals, dead animals, dead bodies. Oh, it was, it was a terrible scene. They came with the breathlessness. They came with the tears in eyes. Quite a number of the patients were unconscious. The froth was coming from their mouth. The froth was coming from their nose. The doctor was amazed. Somebody told him that uh, some gas has escaped from the Union Carbide factory. The poison gas leaked from a pesticide plant, a tiny and obscure outpost of a vast multinational empire. In America, Bhopal had never figured large in Union Carbide's corporate consciousness. Before the accident, I'd never heard of Bhopal. I never even knew they had a plant in India. I, I've never heard of it before the disaster. It's the first we heard of it is after the accident. Bhopal never existed before then. The people were coming on rickshaw. They were coming on the shoulder of other people. They were cots. Every conceivable vehicle was just carrying bodies and bodies, dead bodies. We didn't know the size of the problem at all at the beginning. As days went on, the numbers started getting higher and higher. The next day's newspaper or the next night's television would have different figures. They were just pouring kerosene oil on the bodies, just for, for and just burning them without covering them. A lot of people couldn't believe it that something like that would happen. I mean, we never expected an accident of of that magnitude to have, never. 2,500 died on the first day alone. On the other side of the world, Carbide's first reaction was defensive. The chemical industry has a, an outstanding safety record, and we in Carbide are right at the top of that list. And this tragedy is something that we want to get to the bottom of. Union Carbide has a moral responsibility for this whole issue. So um, we'll do our best uh, to find out uh, what caused this problem and to make sure uh, that everything can be done to help those that were injured. Within three days, Carbide's chairman, Warren Anderson, arrived in the city. He was arrested and charged with manslaughter. The catastrophic scale of the company's potential liability was now becoming clear. Bhopal would require more than first aid and philanthropy. Water had leaked into a tank of the chemical methyl isocyanate, causing an explosive reaction. Every fail-safe system failed due to rust, neglect or disrepair. If carbide was found guilty of providing third-rate safety for its third-world plant, the cost would be incalculable. If this disaster had happened to a city of a million people in Britain or the United States, the damages would beggar the imagination and bankrupt the company. Of course, people here in the Jai Prakash Nagra slum don't need so much money to live on. In lawyers' terms, life is cheaper here. That, after all, is why the carbides of this world come to their various Bhopals, offering work in exchange for low costs and cheap wages. Catastrophe could cause a massive tilt in that unequal contract. As American lawyers flew in, the poor were promised a bonanza and the company threatened with ruin. I don't know, but the award in a case like this should be in the billions. Not one million, but it should be in the billions. They have 200 million insurance. That won't nearly cover for the loss of life and the tragedy and something like this. This, this, this is... Everything. It's the man's home, his family, his children.
Carbide's chairman had negotiated his way out of an Indian jail only to face the bleak facts of Carbide's exposure to damages and compensation claims. So, Whatever Carbide's discomfort, some good could come from Bhopal's tragedy. Here was the opportunity to draw up a blueprint setting fairer standards in the contract between the rich world and the poor. One could have laid down the parameters of the responsibility of multinationals. Of course, here it was in relation to MIC and Union Carbide. But the principles laid down could have been applicable to other multinationals which are engaged or which would hereafter engage themselves in the manufacture of what is known as inherently hazardous product. Bhopal was such a simple case, it was so dramatic, there were no problems in proof of whether or not Carbide really had injured these people. It was clear they had. If they were simply made to pay for it in the future, they and other chemical companies would spend the money necessary to avoid paying those kinds of damages. That's what we hoped. That was the opportunity. In New York, as in Bhopal, there was bewilderment and questioning. How could it have happened? Who was to blame? How great was the damage? How much could it cost? Many of the shareholders were concerned for the survival of the company and uh, how much their investment would be worth uh, in light of Bhopal. They were worried about the value of their stock, uh, whether Carbide uh, would end up having to pay judgments of billions of dollars and uh, whether there would be a company left after that. For Union Carbide, it was a battle for survival. If the case had gone into court in the United States and had reached a jury of Americans, that Carbide would be paying from five to ten billion dollars, and that was more than their equity at that time, and so that would have meant bankruptcy for Carbide. But there are no millionaires in Bhopal today. Carbide has avoided the legal and financial punishment it feared, while the poor of Bhopal are poorer than ever. And six years later, people are still dying from the gas at the rate of one a day. Ramjas Patam was a recent victim. For six years, the family nursed him as he lay gasping. They had to borrow to buy him medicines. Like thousands, they've survived only on debt. There is a pattern in disasters. The high initial casualties soon fall off. But in Bhopal, the queues at the city hospital get longer. Victims who once seemed cured now come back more ill. A new generation of victims wasn't even born when the gas burst on Bhopal. Children born to parents in the worst affected areas have increasing and unexplained problems of the stomach, lungs and eyes. Doctors offer relief, there are no cures. As for Union Carbide, at its Connecticut headquarters, the company is in sparkling health. Carbide now enjoys a global reputation for its skill in crisis management, the successful containment of catastrophe. Bhopal, they say, is now safely behind them. Union Carbide wouldn't talk to us beyond a statement saying they paid $470 million as full and final settlement for the sick and the 4,000 dead. It cost Exxon five times as much when nobody died, but their tanker polluted the Alaskan coast. People were concerned with uh, judgments in the billions of dollars, and uh, the case was settled for four to five hundred million dollars, which, while it may be a lot of money, in terms of, of the fears of, uh, of Wall Street and the fears of investors, it was far less than they had expected. <laughs>